speaker uh, will be Dr. Abraham Verghese. Uh, he is professor for the theory and practice of medicine and senior associate chair of the Department of Internal Medicine here at Stanford. Uh, so in addition to his novel, Cutting for Stone, uh, Dr. Verghese is the author of the nonfiction works, uh, My Own Country, A Doctor's Story, uh, which is about his experience as a physician in rural Tennessee at the beginning of the AIDS crisis, um, and also The Tennis Partner, A Story of Friendship and Loss. Um, also speaking uh, after Dr. Verghese will be Dr. Fadi Judah, um, who is a poet and a former practitioner with Doctors Without Borders in Darfur, Sudan, um, and in Zambia. Um, he has also translated the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish and Ghassan Zaktan. And in 2007, he won the Yale Younger Poets Competition for his collection, The Earth in the Attic. Um, finally, we have Mark Johnson, who is the Philip H. Knight Professor of Liberal Arts and Sciences in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Oregon. Uh, his most recent works uh, include uh, The Meaning of the Body, Aesthetics of Human Understanding, Philosophy in the Flesh, The Embodied Mind, and Its Challenge to Western Thought, and that was co-authored with George Lakoff. Um, moral Imagination, Implications of Cognitive Science for Ethics, um, and a second edition of the seminal and hugely important work, Metaphors We Live By, also co-authored with Lakoff. Um, so a final announcement about the format of this roundtable, which is somewhat different um, from our usual practice. Um, what we're planning to do, since Dr. Verghese has to step out in the middle, um, is for uh, Drs. Verghese and Judah to give their talks first, um, and for those to be followed by a Q&A um, moderated by Blakey Vermeule, who is a professor of English here at Stanford. Um, after about an hour, uh, so um, roughly half an hour then of presentations, half an hour of questions, and after that we'll hand it over to Professor Johnson, who will give his talk um, and who will take questions after, after that. So in other words, kind of two parts. The first one focusing on Dr. Vergese and Dr. Judah, Ver Vergese, excuse me, um, and the whoops, second one um, focusing on Professor Johnson's talk. Um, so I hope that all seems clear. If not, we will figure it out as we go along. Um, but I hope you will join me in welcoming our panelists. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to be here. I'd like to thank Nancy for including me in, in, in this and also for accommodating my crazy schedule. I have to get to the airport, which is why I'll be leaving uh, at about 12.15 or so. Uh, but thank you again for allowing me to be part of this. Um, I must say I reflected on the title Embodied Conscience, and the immediate thing that came to my mind was my experience uh, as a young physician uh, during the HIV epidemic. I found myself uh, in a strange situation. I was not homophobic, but I was certainly homo-ignorant. And the most visible patient population that I immediately encountered uh, was that of gay men. Uh, first in Boston, where I was uh, training in infectious disease just as AIDS came along. But then later, I moved from Boston to Johnson City, Tennessee, population 50,000 in the year 1985. And so I was going to the rural south, and all the predictions were that a town like that of 50,000 could expect uh, one HIV-infected person every other year, instead of which, in a very short time, I was following almost 100 people with HIV infection uh, in a town of 50,000, almost 100-fold more than anyone would have predicted. And as you can imagine, it, uh, was a, it was an interesting sort of experiment, pitting well-entrenched beliefs, well-entrenched prejudices against a modern disease that seemed to uh, immediately um, highlight all the beliefs and prejudices that people had. And I think, to make a long story short, I think the most striking thing to me of that experience was that, that uh, love and family trumped all forms of prejudice and, uh, and all forms of exclusion. Uh, that was sort of the enlightening message is that for the most part, people behaved very well. But the, the part that I want to speak to is the behavior of physicians, which wasn't always the best. I think that historically there have been many epidemics that have put physicians at risk, uh, beginning with the plague, smallpox, uh, influenza every year, famously. Uh, but I think in the last um, almost century, 
it's become somewhat uncommon, less common for physicians to feel themselves at personal risk of dying from something. Uh, but uh, AIDS was very much a reminder that we were dealing with something that could threaten, even though, as most of you know, it's really not a threat to a physician who's taking care of patients with AIDS, unless you happen to be a surgeon and cut yourself or something like that. Even then, the risk is quite low. But AIDS and that experience certainly brought out all those prejudices. And uh, I, o I also thought that, I always thought that AIDS was a wonderful litmus test for how physicians uh, would react uh, and how you sort of got to know their true nature in the face of that, that epidemic. Um, I remember one time I had a patient who couldn't swallow anymore because he had very severe infection of his esophagus and I needed a surgeon to put in a Hickman catheter, a catheter to feed him by vein. And I approached a young colleague of mine. We had trained together. I had every reason to think that I could approach him. And uh, to my great surprise, he balked when I asked him to put in the catheter. And I was tremendously disappointed. And while I was trying to figure out what to do, his senior, uh, the nurse paged me to say that the patient was being wheeled to the OR, to the operating room, and the senior colleague in that practice, a crusty old surgeon who was famous for throwing his instruments, was actually putting in the catheter. And when he came out of the OR, I, I thanked him and I said, you know, Dr. Long, what made you put in the catheter when your colleague uh, hesitated, and he said, son, the day I practice surgery based on my patient's gender, religion, sexuality is the day that I give up surgery. So AIDS was this wonderful litmus test in, this, in a strange sort of way, and the world was divided into those who did and those who did not. And people felt very free in those early years to say things to you uh, as clearly as this, um, you know, I don't want to get involved in caring for that faggot patient. As far as I'm concerned, I think they should all die. This is God sent. These are words uttered by physicians. Now, people might still feel that, uh, perhaps, but clearly the tide has turned and you're not, it's not politically correct to voice those kinds of opinions anymore. But it was in that era. And the word that came to my mind in thinking about that experience was conscience. Uh, it's become a hot topic to discuss, and I think maybe you already did discuss it this morning or yesterday the business of the conscience exclusion, where your beliefs and values uh, make you feel that you cannot participate in a certain kind of medical care. Uh, that was usually invoked in the setting of abortion, in the setting of taking part in uh, executions. Uh, I think it was a poor sort of, uh, it was a poor argument to make in the setting of taking care of people whose lifestyles you objected to. Uh, but that certainly was the experience that, that, I, that I had. Uh, recently, we had a new epidemic, SARS. Uh, one of the first people to die from SARS was a physician uh, working for the WHO. Uh, I think of him as something of a hero. And um, many, many other healthcare workers in Hong Kong and also in Toronto became infected with SARS. And again, it raised the whole issue of, as a physician, is risk a part of what you expose yourself to, personal risk. This is slightly different from what, what you were talking about in the earlier panel, where you're making judgments about patients. This is more judgments about yourself and whether to expose yourself. And there were some very interesting dialogues. For example, in Toronto, medical students were at one point exempted from the hospital most affected. It was thought that physicians could put themselves at risk, but it was unfair to put people in training at risk which I thought was a little strange. Um, there were physicians who objected to being excluded from seeing their families for the next two, three weeks. Uh, there were some who had almost taken on a nine to five mentality and said, oh, this is not my job. So once again, we were struck by people's reactions that were noble and less than, less than noble. And it raises the question of, is there an embodied conscience, especially within medicine? Is there a share of, is there a set of shared values that we all subscribe to? And perhaps I'll, I'll stop with that as my opening remarks and, uh, and pass it on to Fadi and we can explore this further. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, so I, I wanna talk about, uh, uh, loosely about the, the ethics of triage <clears throat> as a concept. 
uh, and, uh, and also perhaps uh, another way I call it is an allergy for neurotransmitters. Um, I was uh, very fascinated by uh, remembering and, and coming across a uh, um, Shakespeare's uh, line in Hamlet, um, thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And what interested me is not the analysis and the context of, of that sentence in, his, in the famous soliloquy, but the actual use of the word. Uh, at the turn of the 17th century, when Hamlet was finished or written, arguably the time, um, the, the word still doubled for both meanings, conscience and consciousness. It hadn't made officially the distinct separation in English usage that it came to, uh, particularly after Locke. So I became very interested in, uh, in, in the notion that perhaps Shakespeare, if, if I can loosely say that, represents an evolutionary moment, a different evolutionary moment for conscience as a word and as a concept than the focus we've had on uh, Locke um, and sort of uh, the legal uh, and historic and religious uh, way of conversing. And for me, there is something more beautiful in, in, in um, re resorting to Shakespeare, who is sort of does not belong to a system per se. Um, so I, I, I'll go on with uh, between sort of speaking and, 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 uh, and reading. Of course, one does not want to wax lyrical, nostalgic about a simpler human past whose intuition or original wisdom, for lack of a better word, remains not necessarily inferior to our so-called progress. Yet now that the delineation between the two words, conscience and consciousness, is so stark, a border exists between them that requires visa and passport, channels that are semi-membranous for some, impermeable or free-flowing for others, an existence or entrapment between system and culture. Equally, one can also move toward a trinity of development, or perhaps a trident, not the devil per se, but perhaps Poseidon, of conscience, consciousness, and conscientiousness. I would also like to cite Giambattista Vico's dictum, for while the mind perceives itself, it does not make itself. I like that idea of uh, uh, expressing consciousness. To me, Vico's new science is one of the earliest theses, among many other things, that the book is on the anthropologic evolution of conscience. His three ages of the divine, the heroic, and the human, which can be partially derived from langu language use, the use of metaphor, metonymy, and reason. His theory of, th of their recurrence in nations and his constructivist epistemology as evident by the phrase, for while the mind perceives itself, it does not make itself, are worth mentioning in passing. The origin of consciousness, one can also extrapolate this from Vico, arose from an unsplit brain that merged the magnanimous moral act with the abhorrent one in the same ironic split second, an ancient idea of poetic wisdom. So one can also argue that this is, you know, what th this points a finger to what we know or don't know about what was happening in the uh, sort of the brain at the time uh, more than 5,000 years ago, according to Vico and the sort of the, the Homeric mind. Um, and in keeping, again, just because I will come back to this later, with the poetic notion of things, I'd also like to throw in the mix Carl Gustav uh, Jochmann's <clears throat> essay in the early, uh, early in the 19th century, The Regression of Poetry which Walter Benjamin revived and republished with an introduction. In it, Jochmann postulates that the decline of poetry in the modern public sphere, and, and Jochmann does actually sort of um, hint to Vico, and so does Benjamin, that the decline of, public, uh, of poetry in the modern public sphere can be largely attributed to human progress. That is, it is a good sign for us. Less reliance on poetry means more progress. But again, in the essays, not so quick, Jokeman and Benjamin question the notion of progress itself. All I mean to do here is to construct seemingly disparate examples from a similar period that help illuminate the notion of conscience in relationship to knowledge and evolution acquired and inherited within the brain. A neuroscientist would have been most welcome uh, here today, but meantime, one must consider an allergy for neurotransmitters. 
Fast forward to now, to where our persistent difficulty of capturing the origins of consciousness is slowly replaced by the exciting journey of gene and brain mapping. Yet, as with law, a very intricate and intimate bond links power and knowledge, truth and method. The archaeology of scientific discourse, for me, is both frightening and real. I dislike the adjacency or nexus of map to gene and brain. I can't help but think of the echo another Shakespearean phrase imprints on my mind in King Lear when the ailing king says to his chamberlains, meantime, we will express our darker purposes, the map there. Whether the map is something already pre-populated and awaiting illumination, awaiting our full consciousness of it, like Columbus's America or racial theory or Asiatic modes of production, etc., or whether it is a body without organs which we populate into a machine that becomes us, we have reached an age where conscience is now a subject, more than ever before, and subject <coughs> to modulation. I guess in a way I'm interested in the way that actually, again, back to Vico, <coughs> um, we, we are heavy participants in the evolution of conscience now at, at, this, at this particular moment of uh, sort of the, the scientific uh, um, advance more than, more than ever before. And uh, um, I like the juxtaposition to Shakespeare because I like that Shakespeare sits at a moment, again, next to Locke, uh, about 400 years ago, where his genius basically summarizes human conscience that came before up to that moment and still projects itself simultaneously into, uh, into the future, uh, into our present moment as well. It is less important to me whether conscious and consciousness were a singular body that became eventually split, necessarily or inevitably, than to understand that in this case the journey home is not more beautiful than home. I am not seeking a utopian idea of the categorical imperative, a universal morality, a oneness of conscious, an illusion of international law. Conscious does not and cannot have a confined resonance on the whole, as we all agree. But the relationship between power and science, whose effect and affect is modulation, is alarming. I am, not, I am most interested in what I consider to be the defining structure of our thinking about conscience and ethics of triage. Almost every moral or immoral act we perform is based on a computed or non-computed process of collateral damage assessment. This is true of medicine as it is of war, of policy as it is of love. And love is no policy as a think tank man once emphatically enlightened me. <laughs> to return to Shakespeare yet again, in Hamlet he writes, purpose is but a slave to memory. Again, this is a, a remarkable phrase. Vico's constructivist epistemology echoes Shakespeare, and Hamlet here is immensely neuroscientific, as memory remains the sister of consciousness, of conscience, which we know little about still, but are learning quite a great deal. Our hunger to know is as necessary as it is elegiac in a futuristic sense. So far, it is through the concept of triage that power, divine or human, manifests itself. This is not inevitable, not accidental or coincidental fighting. It has been a structural one for quite some time, and I would argue it's not an anomalous one. Um, you know, it's, it's a really shaky moment. Uh, and seems to have reached its, its zenith in this age where almost anything is turned into system and method. The ethics of triage ultimately is based on the moderation or modulation of violence, which is an essence of violence itself. The human body itself has been, since the days of the medical scientific revolution in France in the 18th century, the days of Charcot, Bichat, and others, approached from the angle of violence and then subjugated to it, all in the name of the greater good and the least possible evil. It seems inconceivable now to imagine an alternate course for the human imagination and faculty of reason beyond the one we are captive to, the mathematics of knowledge, the organization of the body, the cellularization of life, the molecularization of knowledge. What will happen when the genetic code is fully mapped, when every time an area or synaptic network of the brain lights up on the PET scan, we subjugate it to our consciousness and also subjugate our conscience to it? The economy of violence, the ethics of triage, not only deeply permeate the practice of medicine in our world, but also the practice of humanitarian medicine and intervention all over the world, and also law, domestic and international. Technology, 
and Sherry spoke to this, becomes a moral tool to govern the patient who, by definition, is temporarily or chronically a displaced person. The patient is displaced within the world body as refugee or as citizen, as subject, and also naturally within the word body. It is worth exploring, for example, how modern medicine serves, and I, I am being provocative and extreme here, and sustains the power structures that actually govern it, uh, govern it and protect it. I would argue that in many examples, the practice of medicine today through the ethics of triage, consciously and conscientiously, is an accomplice in the production and maintenance of patients as prisoners of illness, as well as in the production of illness itself in the name of health and inquiry. Humanitarianism also helps maintain, for example, in parallel, the refugee in an age of nation state, captive to governance in limbo land of international law. Every successful story, every defeat of death, as it were, also serves, serves to soften the blow of this argument and to augment the ethics of triage to legitimize it further. The good done for so many becomes alibi to silence the conversation, as if empire or colonialism is devoid of good. Of course it's not. As if humanitarianism is not a neo-church of colonialism or a church of neo-colonialism and its civilizing mission. Even compassion has slowly given way to evidence and the evidence-based, to histology and pathology, in other words, to forensics. Empathy and witness evolve into objectivity, and objectivity is subjugated to law, and law is king, as Thomas Paine said. Medical practice is based on statistical evidence that justify violence or the sacrificial, in favor of the greater good and the least suffering. Everything seems entrapped into the barbarism of reflection, as Vico suggested. Thus, an economy of death follows. The language that binds medicine to military is terrifying, as Sontag pointed out, for example. Greater good, lesser evil binaries now seem to dictate all our actions, justify even horror, and there are horrors worse than death. Life and death become administered things, entities, and subjects. Evolution of conscience becomes an economy of choice the powerful will dictate. All this, as Hamlet spoke, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied over with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pith and moment with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. I'm not proposing an answer, a solution, an action here. I am starting with a question, perhaps an old one, to refuse or to not refuse, therefore I am. Between preemption and proportion, one is left to believe paralysis is not an action, not a motion. The consciousness of paralysis, however, especially in its severe forms, like the aptly named, for instance, neurologic condition, locked in syndrome, will perhaps offer us, among other pathologies of consciousness, so much hope to break out of this. Until then, how will science continue to play the role of servant in the ethics of triage, the economy of suffering in this genetic age, and for how much longer? Linking to Vico and Shakespeare again, I hope Vico got it wrong with his cycle of nations. This uh, age of the, the divine, the, the, uh, the heroic, the human, and then the barbarism of reflection and the return back to the same cycle. That it is not inevitable that we can break the cycle. But I also hope that we reach the day, speaking of the regression of poetry, when Shakespeare is to us as are the Homeric myths or as is poetry, perhaps the regression of Shakespeare would also mean that we have truly evolved, achieved true progress, broken the cycle. Because it would mean that all that Shakespeare documented about conscience and his brilliant plays is no longer, is, is only a, um, a relic of, human, of the human past. That modulating our genes and neurotransmitters was not just another entrapment. Thank you.
Well, I'd like to comment on Fidi's paper, uh, so much more lyrical than, and uh, well thought out than my comments. I must say that I, I've always been intrigued with this notion of the bicameral mind and its breaking down. Um, but it com I think com it comes back to the question I posed at the beginning, which is, um, is there such a thing as an embedded set of values in medicine that we all subscribe to? Uh, what happened in the AIDS epidemic was strangely that patients took over in a sense. Uh, it was patient advoca advocacy, it was ACT UP, it was organizations like that that basically set the tone for how we in medicine should have behaved. Uh, they took the lead in uh, advocating for drug development, they took the lead in advocating for personal protections uh, and you know, n not violating patient autonomy. So maybe I'll pose this to you, Fadi. And do you think that that the way we are trained in medicine, do you think that medicine really has a set of embodied values, or are they merely things that we state uh, that at times of stress, such as with an epidemic like AIDS, simply vanish? Uh, yeah, and I, and I think you you were with us in the earlier uh, panel where um, you know that these questions in a way came up, and obviously. <clears throat> The embedded the, the values of medicine ha, you know do change with time like like any other value and and they change I think in reflection to the structure in which uh, medicine inhabits or which inhabits medicine um, and uh, and so in short I would say no I don't think there are embodied values I, I would I mean I, maybe I like to sort of use these extreme comments I would like to say that compassion for instance um, is not that hard everybody has it. You know, the, the, I, I shouldn't, you know, as a physician, uh, uh, be uh, sort of receive a clap when I'm, you know, um, sweet to my patients for two reasons. It's simply because some physicians don't do it doesn't mean that I'm doing something special. Uh, second, uh, because I think most people in the street uh, put in the same position with the same knowledge would have the same level of compassion. So. I, Somehow, I think that the uh, the values of of physicians and medicine and dedication and so forth are they're they're sort of universal in a way. They they belong to everybody. Um, and I, I wonder again about this uh, regression of poetry. I also wonder about the regression of medicine and 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 whether we can address that problem. Which is to say, there was a moment when the physician sort of historically or uh, um, embedded in the human mind is sort of a demigod. You know we. We're like the fairy man in the sticks thing, where you know in the river sticks, where we, we you know we we're for, we forget and and forgotten as human as as uh, uh, potential patients or eventual patients too, and uh, and there is this uh, you know so much is we're so much that we do or don't do is looked over, because because people sort of look at us as as the potential savior in that moment from the the, the very feared moment of death. Of dying or of, of, of morbidity, of severe morbidity, and I, I think that um, that is no longer there because of the the progress in law and and science. Um, but I think the remnants to that are, are still very complicated in, in the way we we talk about them. What do you, what are your thoughts on? Well, I think that we we like to periodically in medicine restate our our values, and I think we're by necessity, we have to. We're forced to, to do that. Uh, clearly, the Hippocratic Oath, such as it is, doesn't quite suffice. And it's been rewritten. If it ever existed as one document, it's been rewritten many, many times. And many schools, including ours, uh, as here at Stanford, write our own version of it. We write our own oath. Um, and I've always been surprised by the word professionalism and by the number of papers on professionalism. It seemed to me naively perhaps that that when you entered medicine you had a belief in certain things that were intrinsic to medicine and it, it, it surprised me that in the last two decades we had to have this restatement and subscription to the values of professionalism. Uh, to me they always seem self-evident uh, but clearly there must have been a need because it became a big movement, an important part of the Institute of Medicine, the American Board of Medicine's efforts so you know, I, I think that there's a there's a nice saying in writing circles, which is that character is defined by actions taken under pressure, and 
every time medicine has been pressured, our true character has come through, and it's not always been noble. Uh, I agree with you. I think compassion is easy. Um, but when you're really up against your own values, uh, then you, you have to sort of decide whether you subscribe to something higher, an ideal of medicine that obliges you to do something, even though you may not like it, even though it puts you at some risk. Um, so that's what I think. So um, just a question for Fadi. Um, you, at one point, expressed a certain suspicion of the science. Um, said by a man, though, who of course appreciates the, the, uh, what science has done and can do. Um, but it seems to me we overreact to that sometimes because what, um, and the fear that, oh, we've got a, a phenomenon, con conscience, and it's going to be explained away by cognitive science, that's, to me, that's ridiculous. I mean, what, what are the, every science has a certain set of methods, contested <laughs> methods, they have to define phenomena. The phenomena don't come pre-described. Who tells them, who's going to give them guidance on to who, what the phenomena are? Um, we are. You know, I mean, and, and so they, um, and, and every scientific endeavor, every methodology has a certain set of values, and you can't justify those values in any non-contextual way. So I just want to say it, it's, it's the good news, not the bad news. I mean, yes, you have to be careful. Some people are going to tend to be reductivist, but what we need is a dialogue with poets and um, social scientists and neuroscientists because um, no one owns the phenomena. So, I mean, I just didn't want to feed into a sense of, well, we should stay away from, I mean, that only, only something dangerous that way goes, you know. Yes, I, uh, your, your point is, is well taken, and I, I agree with it. I, I do think, however, that um, uh, his, you know, historically, it's, it's, and, and for the last 400 years, uh, much of knowledge has, has been co-opted, if you will, by power structures and, and, and in the service of power. And I just don't know, and I'm not saying that we should stop searching, you know, we should, we should stop inquiry, but I, I think it's a... Uh, it's, uh, posing a question that actually um, what we have done with knowledge uh, uh, regarding conscience and medicine and, and what have you so far has always been subject to this notion of the ethics of triage. And while I do admittedly put it in some lyrical or poetic or romantic notion of, of sort of an evolutionary moment, and, and but the, my question is, you know, um, maybe when we have the tools to rethink conscience as we modulate conscience as well, then maybe we should also think that we are not eternally stuck with the, with the notion of the ethics of triage and everything that we put forward in creating law or, uh, you know, or, uh, or ethics in, in, in medical practice uh, as well. I'd like to open it up now to, to the audience and see if um, there are responses. I'll, I'll keep the cue. Or Rob, go ahead. Um, it seemed to me that um, Rob, what, we, what we've seen, is that better? That's better. What we have had here are two amazing um, and dramatic examples of conscience, of personal conscience coming to the the, the the practice of a vocation. And that's what so interest, what interests me because um, we are all in vocations and so forth. And it seems to me that in, uh, in Do Dr. Judah's um, paper is an immensely consequential, uh, important, rhetorical urge coming from and it must have come from an act of conscience, and, and, and the same with Dr. Vigesi's uh, dealing with. So I'm, 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 I'm just interested in the drama of conscience here and how it worked, and did it seem when you decided this is wrong, or, or when Dr. Judas said 
triage, the whole, this, is, this has immensely important consequences for how we live. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to see, and, and referring to um, Shakespeare, what, how did you form your act of conscience? How was it defined? Did you need, and, and also, of, of course, uh, Dr. Vergesi, the use of art in, in, in the, develop, the development of conscience seems to me so um, obvious here, but it seems also so, so dramatic. And so I just, I'm asking you to talk about your moment of, 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 your, of, of, of how conscience actually worked for you in what in, in what you've been presenting today, what was the act of conscience? What was the history of con, uh, conscience there? Well, I, I think uh, maybe I can start by saying that um, I don't think that my act of conscience was intrinsic. I think it was very much a dynamic evolution. Um, I remember that I actually chose the specialty of infectious disease. Because to me, it was the one subspecialty in internal medicine that was all about cure, ironically. So I looked around at the cardiologists putzing around with their rotor rooters and everything comes back. And, and I thought, you know, infectious disease, at least at the time I went into training, was the one specialty where, you know, you made an astute diagnosis on a patient coming back from the Congo with fever and rash, and they rose like Lazarus and walked out of there. And, <laughs> There was, great iron, there was great irony in a fatal illness uh, landing in the lap of someone like me who I think was caught up in what I call the conceit of cure. I wasn't the only one. There was a whole generation of us who were caught up in what I think, is, think of as the conceit of cure, the sense that we could fix anything and if we couldn't, it was because the patient had come too late, the protoplasm was weak. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't our failing. And AIDS was, was, I think, immensely humbling and I think my my initial reaction when AIDS first came along was, you know, one of excitement and new disease. And then I think as we saw just how vast and how pervasive this virus had become and the sense that almost every patient we were seeing would suffer this in inexorable downhill decline, it, it really became, uh, it became a crisis of, of, of faith for me. Did I really want to be in this? Did I want to keep doing this? Uh, there were very clearly people who had opted out. My chief of infectious disease at Boston City Hospital uh, was of a generation for whom the AIDS virus seemed to break all the rules. And he would have nothing to do with it. He actually relegated AIDS to the oncology folks to take care of because they were taking care of the hemophiliacs who had HIV. And um, I remember the thing that changed things for me was reading Randy Schultz's book, uh, And the Band Played On, ironically. It was that book that made me, and many of us, I think, feel like not only had medicine terribly failed the patient population, but we in infectious disease who, you know, supposedly this was our specialty, we could do a lot better. And I think that was the moment that I turned my practice to becoming, that's all I did was HIV. But, but I also had to confront things that uh, were clearly in my embedded conscience, if you will. As I said, I don't think of myself as being homophobic, but I clearly didn't have friends who were homosexual. I didn't know anything about gay society. And to me, one of the miracles of that, that experience of working with AIDS in rural Tennessee was to watch my own transformation. In fact, that became the basis of the, my first book, My Own Country. A lot of it was about how I changed. And I changed from, from being homo-ignorant to coming out at the other end to being not just empathetic, because that doesn't quite describe it, but but having an acute sense of uh, you know, what a loss it had been in my life not to have been around gay men before, and I'd never met any, any population more heroic. And I learned so much about manliness, ironically, from gay men, uh, because so much, of what, what pauses, pauses, so much of what passes for malehood in our society, particularly from my viewpoint in an emergency room, it's not maleness, it's a sort of false machismo. It's a, it's a you know, a, uh, playing with guns and toys that uh, it's believed will attract the other sex or would be appealing to them. And to be around gay men was to sort of see what the spectrum of maleness could be, that you could be interested in the arts, you could be a good friend to a woman. You know, there were things that, that I learned. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say in reply to your question is that 
I didn't sort of come to this point where a situation made me clearly feel that I fell on this side of the line. I think it was very much something that evolved. And I actually felt that medicine failed me for not articulating more clearly where the line should have been. Uh, my role models in medicine, many of them failed me for not stepping up to the line. And some of the most unexpected people inspired me for, for, for stepping up to the line. And everyone would have predicted that in the Deep South, where there was so much racial and religious prejudice, that patients with AIDS would have been badly ostracized. And many were, but many were also received with a great deal of love. And if you're curious as to why a town of 50,000 had a hundredfold more HIV than anyone predicted, that turned out to be an interesting American paradigm of migration. It, was, it represented gay men who had grown up in a small town, that small town, and left for all the same reasons that you and I leave small towns, jobs, education, opportunity. But in their case, they were also leaving because they were gay and did not want to live under the scrutiny of their friends and relatives and went to the big city, found themselves decades later, the virus found them and they were now coming back because they were ill. So I would say that the individual conscience is very fluid and evolves and it, you know, one can learn to have a better conscience, if you will. Uh, but, as, uh, but I still have a sense that the embedded values of medicine needed to be defined more clearly uh, before the next epidemic comes along. We have to be very clear about these things. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree with the, that, that this uh, notion of conscience is, is really a dynamic one. Uh, and uh, it cannot be, you know, fixed to one moment or one event. And uh, uh, extrinsic and ex and intrinsic. I mean, I, I'm sure that uh, one's makeup also from a younger age, when you think of what uh, ethics are, are, and then you're confronted with certain situations that fail you, or you fail them, or or you step up to the plate, so to speak. Then they they sort of force you to uh, to think differently. Um, you know, I, I can say various things. Uh, I, I'm sure you share them, but you didn't. You didn't mention it of, of a background. You know, my parents were uh, uh, grew up as refugees, as Palestinian refugees, and uh, and much of my family. And uh, so I had a different awareness of uh, sort of the uh, the marginalization or dehumanization that people undergo because of this sense of extreme otherness. Um, um, and uh, as a physician, also working in a county hospital. Um, I began to realize this concept, this manly concept of, of heroics, of, of uh, lifesavers, and I began to be a little disgusted by it, in fact, uh, because I, I, I never learned that fully uh, until I went with Doctors Without Borders, and I can tell you many narratives, and I realized that uh, I'm, I'm actually not a lifesaver. I, I, you know, it would be incredibly arrogant uh, to, to, to think that I saved a life or took it. Um, of course, one can take a life, but at least, I, I, you know, in, in a sense that uh, it, <clears throat> there's this great line in Humboldt's gift, I think, and I'd probably paraphrase it, or Saul Bellow, where he says the, the nobility of taking a life. It, it, in a sense that, you know, the, the whole notion that of taking a life uh, uh, bestows nobility on, on a person. And I thought that how horrible that actually this accurate statement, this accurate conscience, actually still permeates so much of the practice of medicine today. And it would be one thing I would like to see different in medicine, that we, we no longer think that we actually are lifesavers for people, um, even if people think of us that way. Uh, I think uh, I would also like to tell a story. We, we talked about uh, Herb Fred, my mentor, <coughs> a, a, an old man from Waco, Texas. Uh, in one of his first lectures to us uh, said, the first patient I killed, it, you know, and I was, I was like, what? You know, I was like, uh, you know, you're looking around for cops or something. And, and what he did, what he did, he killed the patient by giving the patient penicillin, and the patient had anaphylactic shock, had never been exposed to penicillin before. So in a sense, it's not his fault. And you can argue that the use of the expression I killed or the first patient I killed was wrong. But he didn't have a problem with it. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to feel guilty after 60 years. Or, he was just aware that he had a power. And it was this sense of power for me at a younger age that shocked me. Um, and again, in Doctors Without Borders, I, I, I have no qualms about saying that I was part and parcel of the, uh, of the death 
of, 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 of some people, uh, intentions aside. And these things are, are very shocking. They never leave you. And, and I, when I came back and I realized part of the reason we hide behind it uh, here is, is earlier, as I said, is because there's an infrastructure that covers your ass, pardon me for the, you know, as we say, CYA, right? This is a, another thing about developing acronyms in medicine. So. Your use of Deleuze, and I wanted to sort of figure out what you, um, what you could imagine conscience looking like in a sort of Deleuzean framework, because it's clear that the sort of the body, the edge of the body, is a real problem in in um, medicine. But when you talk about the conscience in relation to that that sort of Deleuzean miasma or the body without organs, I'm I'm not really sure I understand where the edges of that would be, um, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure Deleuze himself understands, and I'm not sure I do either, and uh, I did not, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I use the body without organs as one of the options, and uh, I wasn't necessarily in favor of it. I mean, Deleuze has his own problems with uh, toolboxing everything into a machine structure. Um, and I think that there's a moment uh, where uh, sort of, I mean, he is a, a sort of a, a close relative of and friend of Foucault, which I have problems, who I have problems with, with his, his you know, absolute focus on methodology um, and discourse. But uh, so there, there is an element, my desire is to bring, to bring these issues up, the language that, uh, of, of many structures that actually inform the way we think uh, about medicine and to still hope for something, um, a different approach to, to uh, the humane. But there's a problem with awareness, right? That, that in this BWO, there's no consciousness or awareness that is accessible. So I'm just sort of wondering if, if awareness and embodiment are two separate things, and for the sort of the tool structure to be a forward and not conscious, how do you, if that is one way to go, how would you accommodate the need for thoughtful? Yeah, I think there are different ways to answer this. One is theoretical, and I think one uh, is, uh, uh, which I'm not necessarily going to claim that, I'm, that I have a, a framework for, but I think one is also more practical and immediate, and someone who's sort of participating in the medical education, like Dr. Verghese, probably could speak to this as well. Um, um, I'm not sure that I fully understood the question, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass unless you can define it more concretely for me. Just, just that in the in the theoretical approach that Dr. Judah was sort of discussing as a possibility, as a way to get rid of some of the, um, in in your description, the sort of machismo and the, the in some ways self preservation that happens on the part of physicians in medical practice, that maybe in a, a turning away from the sort of individuated body and the relationship between the physician and the patient would lead towards something that is a little bit more miasmatic or flexible um, network, a network, right? But that it doesn't seem to me that what you described as that kind of coming into awareness or thoughtfulness or self, so, sort of reflection um, would be possible in that, in a, a, a practice that would engage that theoretical approach. So I'm wondering if there is a way to mitigate some of the institutional problems that come about by a kind of directed hierarchical patient-doctor relationship. Um, if, if there is a way to do that, that that doesn't depend in some way on what we would understand to be conscience or moral integrity on the part of the physician. If there's a way to move forward, to move away from that that would still protect the, the um, um, I'm not using this word very loosely, the sort of progressive impulse of medical practice. Well, I, mean, I think we, you know, we, we've not touched on a major issue of conscience. Uh, this may or may not relate to your question directly, but we have a pervasive systemic problem of conscience in, in a sense of medicine because you know, medicine is big business. Uh, the other day my 
agent was speaking to me in some context, and she said, uh, she threw out the statement. She said, and face it, Abraham, medicine is corrupt. And I wanted to protest. I wanted to find some way to counter what she had just said. Uh, but, then, but then I realized in, in many ways she's right. I mean, we have, um, you know, this industry that basically revolves around the patient and is maximized to generating great profit. And all of us, you know, benefit from that. We're paid, in a sense, off that. So there's, there's, there's much, much larger issues. I mean, to give you a simple example, if you look around, you see short-stay surgery clinics, you see birthing centers, you see women's health centers, you see cardiac care centers. Have you ever seen a freestanding geriatric center with a three-story atrium and valet parking and, uh, you know, concierge to help you get to your appointment? And that is the burning need of this nation, is good geriatric care for your parents and mine. And so I'm not sure if you're getting at that, but I think, you know, we, if we're talking about conscience, uh, and I think this is part of what we're arguing for, is that it really has to begin and be reflected in the way we approach the healthcare of the nation. Uh, and then at its smallest micro microscopic level, it's also reflected in the way the patient and the physician interact. But if the patient and the physician are interacting in a system that's largely run by, you know, uh, judgments based on not what's the best health care for the country, but what vested interests are strong enough to protect themselves from being destroyed, then you have a basically a corrupt system that's unconscionable, I think. And with that, I'm going to have to take my leave of you. I have a plane to catch. Forgive me. There's so much discussion that I know I'm going to be missing. So, um, last summer, <laughs> I, it was a nice, beautiful summer day in Eugene, and I walked out to my car after work, and there was a little piece of paper in my windshield, and I got in my car, and I, I took out the paper, and it said, ran into your car, very sorry, call me. <laughs> okay, it was like Carly Rae Jepsen, call me maybe. Um, and so I called her. And uh, she was a very nice person. And at the end of our conversation, I said, you know, um, I want to thank you because some people, you know, that you ran into my car. I don't thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. But that you left a note. And I said, a lot of people wouldn't do that. And she said to me, well, I do have a conscience. And that was when I was starting to think about conscience. And, and so I want to say, well, does anybody have a conscience? And so I'm going to make the following suggestion. I'm going to suggest that the very notion of conscience is not doing any useful work. And I'm not saying that what we've talked about today or anything we've talked about in this conference is, aren't real moral phenomena that we need to pay attention to. I'm just not convinced that the notion of conscience is doing any work for us. So let me see if I can make the case and what would come after it. So I want to start uh, with the Jiminy Cricket view of conscience. And remember how he says, you know, he's trying to tell Pinocchio, uh, you know, there's this still small voice within you that's going to let you know. And Pinocchio trying to figure out how do I be a boy and, you know, and he, he doesn't know what's right from wrong. And so Jiminy Cricket, remember, he says, just remember the song, just give a little whistle, you know, and always let your conscience be your guide. <laughs> well, that's the Jiminy Cricket view. And it's, it's the idea that every human being has implanted in her by God or evolution or pure practical reason or take your pick, where, whatever, um, something called conscience. And that conscience... Um, does what? <laughs> it would somehow be the key to you knowing what the right thing to do is, and it would also be a motivating force that would move you to act morally. So look, what I'm going to attack is that notion. I'm going to say that's a notion that it, it's turned around the way we ought to think about conscience and moral deliberation. 
because it says that it's all up there fr in front and whether then that it has to be made, it has to be discovered, it has to be worked out in an ongoing fashion. So I'm going to say we have to replace this mistaken view um, that I think is based on an outdated faculty psychology from the uh, um, especially got worked up in the 17th century, we need to replace it with an account of conscientiousness. So basically I want to make an argument that John Dewey made in um, Ethics in 1932 and in Human Nature and Conduct in 1922. Now, so we, I can fly through this now because we went through this in nice, beautiful accounts given of this, but I want to point out the, con the concept of conscience that I'm, I'm challenging has a, a long tradition, and um, it's nicely set out in Aquinas. Remember, he had two capacities, you might say, and activities, cinderesis, which is this natural disposition of the mind by which one directly apprehends the basic principles of morally correct behavior. And then you have to do what? You know, that'd be like, do, do good and avoid evil is one of Aquinas' things. Okay, do good and avoid evil. Um, but these principles then have to get applied. So you gotta, that's where conscientia comes in to apply these to concrete world situations. Yeah, so we know how to act. That's the Jiminy Cricket view. Um, later, okay, so conscientia is the application of knowledge to action. And what this would mean is there probably have to be, you can't just say, do good and avoid evil. Yes, that's what Senderaces tells you. You have to figure out what good and evil mean in this particular context. So you're going to need some secondary principles, and then you're off and running. Okay. Now, Kant comes along, interestingly. And um, Kant collapses cinderesis and conscientia into one thing. Here's what he says, good old Kant, conscience is not something to be acquired, but insofar as every man is moral, is a moral being, he has it originally within him. For conscience is practical reason holding up before a man his duty for acquittal or condemnation in every case under a law the metaphysical principles of virtue, where the law here is supposedly moral law um, imprinted in every human breast by virtue of their rationality. So that's Kant's view of conscience. And look, this guy bites the bullet. Um, I, I, because I worked all these years on metaphor, I just love this stuff. But here he takes the legal metaphor for conscience and he just runs with it with a vengeance. Now, we find in our hearts a prosecutor. So if, you know, you've got a moral law, a prosecutor, for whom there would be no place unless there were also a law. You have a moral law. Well, this law, which is based on reason and not on sentiment, is incorruptible and incontestably just and pure. It is the moral law established as the holy and inviolable law of humanity. Besides these, now what do you need? You need an advocate within you called self-love who brings forward um, many an argument in our defense and who's pleased the prosecutor in his turn endeavors to refute. Lastly, we find a judge within us who either condemns or acquits. It is impossible to blind his judgment. And, all, and if I were doing a metaphor analysis, I'd look at the impossible kind of um, uh, economy of this metaphor and like who's judging who and what part of you is judging some other part of you. But again, this is a classic statement of Jiminy Cricket view of conscience. Now, what I want to say is, um, I, I want to say this is a place where I want to say cognitive science can tell us something, can help us. And it can help us because it can suggest why this view of conscience is a non-starter. And I just want to pass a few things by you. I can't argue for these here, but I, we could discuss them. First, it's based in faculty psychology. The idea that the human mind consists of discrete faculties, powers, like reason, will, um, imagination, sensation, um, feeling, 
and that these powers of mind will explain different types of behavior. So this has the view that our experience comes divided into types, which I think is just false. The idea, there's religious experience, there's moral experience, there's aesthetic experience, there's political experience, there's theoretical. I mean, and, I, and, and following Dewey, I want to say no, those are artificial distinctions that we impose to make sense of things around us. But experience is always thick and rich and deep. It interposes all, intertwines the aesthetic, the moral, the, the religious quality of, of life, all the political, the economic. I mean, that, we could see that in these two talks here. Um, they're beautiful examples of the interweaving of all of that. So uh, here, then, I want to say, um, I'm just going to quote from Antonio Damasio, who I think is one of the best on this. But he says, look, not surprisingly, I believe that ethical behaviors depend on the workings of certain brain systems in a body, he says, in an environment. And he says the environments are social and all, but here he's focused on brain systems. But the systems are not centers. We do not have one or a few moral centers in us any more than we have central executive mechanisms in our brains. Not even the ventral medial prefrontal cortex should be conceived as a center. Moreover, the systems that support ethical behaviors are probably not dedicated to ethics exclusively. That's an important point. We incorporated, we recruited sensory motor stuff, emotion and all, and brought it together in, to, in terms of our, what we call moral problem solving. But it, it, it wasn't, um, it, there's not a separate dimension of us that is our moral faculty. Okay, so he says they, uh, they are dedicated to biological regulation, these systems, memory, decision making, creativity, all of which we need for morality. But I'm going to deny that there's anything called the moral instinct or the moral organ or the moral faculty. And so um, I'm highly critical of Mark Hauser's book, Moral Minds, because he tries to argue for such a faculty. And I think when you look at, if you look at the chapter in his book where he argues for this faculty, and he lays out what's in it, you know, what he, when you know what's in that, all the things you need? You need a human being. <laughs> I mean, it's like saying you've got to have an intact emotional system. You've got to have a planning system. You've got to have an action parson system. You've got to have an intact... Um, you know, feeling state, all of that. Well, that's what a human being is. That's not an, a moral organ. I'm sorry, who is Mark Hauser? Mark Hauser is a, um, an, an, an ethologist um, and uh, animal studies person who then wrote an important book, uh, Moral Minds, and then got himself in trouble and got fired from Harvard um, oh, for... thank you. That's, that's Mark Hauser. I wrote my criticism of him in my, before that came out. And I think it's irrelevant to the quality of his argument. It's an important book. I just reject that dimension of it. There's no such thing as pure moral reason. Moral appraisal is mostly the result of intuitive, non-conscious evaluative processes. If the, one of the things we're learning now is that um, we don't reason adequately without an intact emotional system. And so this reason-emotion split, yes, it makes sense in some contexts. There is contestation between different processes, but there's no such thing as pure moral reason. To get that, you have to have such an impoverished view of reason that it's doing almost nothing. So look, what's, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, um, there's a standard view emerging now. Hauser's got this, Jonathan Haidt, um, has this in his work, um, but it, you know, many, many people are arguing this. And what they're saying is that moral reasoning, moral appraisal runs in two tracks. The, the two tracks are this, <clears throat> an intuitive track, which is unconscious, and I want to remind you that most of our thinking is unconscious and that I would reject the idea that was made earlier that in order to think you need language. Children think, Children have meaning prior to the acquisition of language. When they get language, it becomes a lot richer and articulated symbolically, but thinking operates mostly on the basis of embodied processes, images, neural maps, that sort of thing, and it doesn't necessarily require language. Now, uh, anyway, so intuition 
and is, is, a pro, is, a, is a level at which we respond differentially to situations emotionally. We do it very quick and mostly beneath the level of consciousness. And then the other view is that what philosophers took to be the key to, to morality, which was reasoning, what these people are saying now is interesting. They're saying, no, that's mostly after the fact justificatory reasoning where we, we've already decided and then the, the appraisal's been done and then we make up a likely story and we think we can erect that into a philosophical framework. I, I think that's a pretty damning indictment of a lot of moral philosophy. Um, so, dual process stuff. Well, so here's what you could say. Um, you could say, well, gosh, okay, we don't have conscience in the old-fashioned sense of a faculty that, um, of, of, of reason or something that gives us these principles, but we, this is the new conscience. Conscience is the intuitive. Now, okay, but um, here I'd like to say about that that um, you've, got, you've, you've got a completely different picture here because the intuitive dimension is Con built and constructed and transformative. It's not a given, except that for any person at a particular time, it's given for her where she's at. But it's not an, Im an implanted um, structure, I want to say. So look, no less a philosopher and cognitive scientist than Paul Thagard argues that we need a new non-rationalist model of conscience as involving processes of moral intuitions where, quote, Moral intuitions are brain processes that combine cognitive appraisals with bodily perceptions through neural mechanisms of parallel constraint satisfaction. Thagard observes that this allows us to think of conscience as both cognitive and emotional. Um, and it can explain how there might be universally shared aspects of conscience. Okay, fine, so that's where we are on that. But I wanna say, look, there's something more that human beings have too. And that, so there's not just intu intuition, that's important and that's been denied by a lot of people. It's not just after the fact justification. There's also a process of human reflection, moral reflection, that I wanna call conscientiousness, um, valuation is what Dewey calls it. And um, that this is a process in which you do what? You imaginatively rehearse possible courses of action that seem available to you to, to, and then you have to determine through a feeling state which of those seems to best resolve the tension in the situation you found yourself in. And Dewey has a name for that. He calls it uh, dramatic uh, imaginative rehearsal. Um, yeah, let's, let's go on. So once you recognize that conscience is just a way of speaking about evolved dispositions and culturally shared moral values, which we come to learn through processes of our situated moral development, then conscience ceases to do any interesting work or efficacious moral work because it's not a pre-existing uh, culture transcending moral faculty. It's just to say, so you can talk about the conscience of a, a, a body of physicians, the conscience of a platoon, uh, the conscience of a village. Yes, you, we can use those terms, that's fine. But you're not talking about something, you're, you're talking about dispositions that have, have developed and under certain constraints, I wanna say. So here's the way Robert Hind, I really like him in his book, Why Good is Good, he's so reasonable about this. He says, um, Oh, before I read him, let me just, more, I, so I want to look, I'm saying moral, moral reasoning is a form of complex, socially and culturally profound problem solving. That's what we're engaged in. We're creatures that encounter difficult situations, we've got problems to solve. And, so, and, and philosophers have wanted to say, no, you know, problem solving, oh, that's just hypothetical reasoning or means ends reasoning. No, there's a basis there where you have to evaluate, why do you have a problem? It's because either you have a bunch of values 
that are in conflict in a situation and you, ha you have to decide how to go forward or you're in a complex communal situation where there are con conflicts of values and you have to decide how to go forward. And here's the thing, you can't simply, if, you can't simply go back to what you had before, I want to say, because that's what got you in the plate problem you've got. You can't say, I just got to, I got to, just in my conscience, I got to realize how I, what, what the right thing was. Because that, is, that says that all experience replicates over and over again. That we don't encounter new situations. And I want to say, you don't have a moral problem when you don't encounter a new situation. Your, your, your intuitive level is just going to run its course and you'll do what you do. You only have a moral problem when something doesn't work. When the conditions are changed, and the last thing in the world you want when conditions are changed is to try to reassert the same old principles. That's called moral fundamentalism. And I think moral fundamentalism is cognitively unsound and it's immoral. It's immoral. I think it's one of the scourges we face today. People who say there's an absolute right, we just have to figure out what it is because they shut off the very thing we need, which is moral inquiry. So uh, working toward the end here. This is a statement from Dewey, and I got to give it to, I mean, I'm going to read it, Dewey, maybe not the best writer who ever lived, but philosophically one of the best people who ever lived. Deliberation is actually an imaginative rehearsal of various courses of conduct. We give way in our mind to some impulses. We try in our mind some plan. Following its career through various steps, we find ourselves in imagination in the presence of the consequences that would follow. And so that, that's one thing poetry can do. That's one thing literature does for us. It engages us in the narrative exploration of the possibilities for human meaning and value, I want to say. That's why we get more guidance from poetry, novels, film, than we do from philosophical texts. That seems like a no-brainer to me. <laughs> so let me work toward a quick conclusion here. Here's the way Dewey put this. Dewey <laughs> says, we got to distinguish valuing from valuation. Valuing is simply the fact that you're an you have an intuitive track, that you do right now because of the way you've developed both genetically, evolutionarily, and in your particular history, your mother beat you with a hairbrush and a green dress when you were <coughs> five because you, as I did, painted the sheets that were hanging in the basement with some paint I found there. <laughs> she didn't beat me, but anyway, um, my dad did <laughs> when he got home. So you've got valuings, right? That's just to say you are preferentially disposed to go in certain directions. What you need is a process that doesn't just repeat the valuings because you've run up against something new. You need a process Dewey called valuation, which is the reflective process for critically evaluating our intuitive valuings in order to resolve the tensions in our situation. That's where creative moral imagination has to come in. So let me end. Let me, let me try to... Um, uh, Put, put this in one more way. I hope this is not explaining the obscure with the more obscure, but there's a notion in um, biology of homeostasis. Basically, Damasio says, look, what, we, we are homeostatic systems. And if, here's a good example of this. If your uh, temperature goes over 107, probably don't have to go that far, you're going to be dead, <laughs> right? And you, so your body automatically has, we have evolved systems so that we can retain a homeostatic balance within the organism. And if we don't maintain that, it has to be unconscious, it has to be automatic, run its course. I can't sit there and have to think to make it happen. But homeostasis is bringing a system back to a set point. Now, if that's what morality is, then I'm wrong. That's what some people want morality to be. They want to say there was the right answer, and we just have to get back to it. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to replace homeostasis with what Jay Skolkin calls um, allostasis. 
And allostasis is dynamic equilibrium. We're dynamical systems. Dynamic equilibrium says you don't go back to the original set point. You create a new equilibrium. And the equilibrium, is would, in this case with morality, is going to be in, in culture, in, in, in interpersonal interactions. So, it, so I want to re, say evaluation is the Deweyan notion for the process by which you strive to, by evaluating the situation, you strive to attain what? Um, a new equilibrium that temporarily resolves the tension. But we all know that's just one more thing. Then, then, you know, life is one damn thing after another. Then something else is there. And we have unintended consequences, as people talked about. So um, let, me, let me sum up and just say, I'm, maybe I'm saying, OK, everything we've said about conscience is, um, uh, in, these are important phenomena. But I don't think there's such a thing as conscience. Um, and, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't go on talking about this. It's that um, at least there's not conscience in the Jiminy Cricket sense. Thank you. I, um, I, I have a, a bit of a pushback, but I think because I see hands, I'll ignore my own pushback and um, turn it open to questions, but maybe at a, maybe and, at some point I'll. And, and, and um, this was not said before, but I mean, the idea was now we have another half hour, and um, it's it's a, a response to uh, Fadi's work and comments, and you know, kind of an open discussion. Um, so we wanted to open it up generally in that way. Go ahead. Um, so I think. The normative idea that people should reflect, that seems to me to be highly plausible. Um, uh, how much that undercuts the idea that people may operate with their intuitions, however formed, and that that might be a form of conscience, I think is debatable. But the thing that I, that, the, and I don't think this goes to your major thesis, but this dual process uh -huh. as presented and it, I mean, there may be a more subtle version that's quite convincing, but it, it didn't, it's never struck me as convincing in itself in a simple form. Why do we stop at the red light? We don't think about stopping at the red light. We just put our foot on the brake when we see the red light. So that's our intuition. Does that mean that's not rationally uh, derived, that there isn't a reason for doing that? No, we, the reason for doing that is so embodied in us that we no longer have to think about that. Now, as long as that's true, I don't know how we can be sure that that's not true of some of these things which we're doing, you know, moral feelings and reactions which would be described as reactions of conscience, the influence of the culture of how we were brought up, and maybe some individual process of reasoning at some early stage may so embed things in us mm -hmm. that we do have this intuitive reaction. So I, right. I don't think the fact that if people are reacting in an intuitive way and not thinking about it necessarily shows that it's not based on reason. But, but um, so the part I didn't say anything about is we're not talking, we're, we're, the, the Dewey's fundamental idea is that the locus of everything that matters for us is an organism interacting in an ongoing way with an environment that's at once physical, interpersonal, social, gendered, raced, and all of that. So we've got to get over, when we're talking about intuitive processes, um, mostly the idea there is that it's operating pre, you know, without the need for conscious reflection. But that doesn't mean that it's not formed up in terms of all kinds of patternings of social relations, and and you say there's a rationality to it. I say there could be. Yeah, yes, there could there be. I agree. Light yeah, I agree. But but um, so but see, the rationality, the the tradition. Maybe I'm responding too much to what I bumped my head against for the last forty years in philosophy, but. You know, people have, they want this situation in which there was the right answer. Mostly that means I want to be able to tell you why you were wrong. And, um, and so rationality is, is put forward as a 
a, ontologically a pre-existent structure that involves logical relations and all of that. And I want to say, following Dewey, that we ought to replace no, that notion of rationality with reasonableness and say that reason, re, reasonableness just simply means what brings about in the moment um, a certain kind of ordering. And so you see, I'm not arguing against saying the, there's rash, there's, you, you can give reasons, there's a rationality, there's a reason why these things are in place. I'm, I'm, what I'm arguing against is the, then the hypostatizing of this as sort of there was rationality and to be moral is to map your you know, action or bring your action under that. So I would agree with you. Nancy and then Lucy. Okay. Um, this this kind of comes off of what Kent said, but it's, it might be more extreme. So that might indicate that I I'm not understanding what you're saying because it's so far from from what I do, Mark. But okay, so we've got the intuitive view, which, if I understand you correctly, is the product of possibly just kind of our biology, our a neuro. Your biology, your well, personal experience, yes, your culture, your like we were just saying. It's right. all of that. The intuitive just means it's, that it's going to run its course. It's what Dewey called habit. Mm -hmm. And now we think of it in terms of weighted neuronal um, functional assemblies that are going to fire off under certain. You see the stoplight, and the motor movement goes, you know, so it's and it's, so it's, it's not analogous. just it's not just the body it's the it's the embodiment of meaning and yes. it can it has cultural dimensions and interpersonal okay yeah. so 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 but don't think intuitive as oh well it doesn't have any rationality to it or it's just the, of course I'm I don't think there's a disembodied mind mm -hmm. mind is fundamentally embodied Right, uh, but on, but the intuition is the thing that presents itself automatically yes, and unconsciously, that's right. and and that is because the, you you make these kinds of synchronizations automatically yes. without having to think that's about right. it. It's instant. It's instantaneous. Even though you're saying now that it's it's going to be culturally um, mediated. Mediated. Of course. Yes. So, but it produces this this framework, this principle justification, um, which you say is, well, what I'm saying is that if intuition is not a given, um, it, but it is framed by a, a kind of particular situation, then it seems to me that framework, the framework that it evolves into when you're doing, when you're, you've got, you're doing the principal justification part, that also has to be very particular. It's a historically particular framework. Right. That, so, so I'm wondering, first of all, if that isn't kind of a, a circular. I, I guess I, I think I have three questions. That would be number one. If the difference between the intuition, the, the first step, and the framework, the second step, which is conscience, it, I mean, which is uh, all part of this process, if there's not a circularity there in that, in that whether conscience, conscious, oh, these words get so confused, conscious or unconscious intuition and conscious reflection are not kind of, uh, if that's not kind of a circular structure because both are determined by something else. I respond to that first so I don't yeah. forget. So it, pretty straightforwardly, um, so what Haidt and others would say is, look, it's, that, it's, that we, we will justify our actions in a kind of reflective way mm -hmm. to give a justification for what, for the cognitive appraisal that's already gone on intuitively. Let me give you the kinds of experiments they do. So they take, they, 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 they tell the students um, a story. They say there's a brother and sister and um, their, their parents are out of town, and they think it'd be nice to have sex together. Now, they're, 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 um, and they, they're just going to try this out, so they go out to their parents' beach house, and they, um, they make sure you know, she's on birth control, and he uses a condom, and you know, they just <laughs> want to do it this one time. That's it. They'll never do it again. And people will say it's you know, it's, it, it's, it's immoral, okay? They have this immediate, intuitive, that's not right. 
And then, so then they'll ask them why. And people will start making up, all, they'll, they'll say things like, well, a baby could come from that. And they said, no, but in the story, it was, you know, not, that was not a possibility. Um, you know, but then it could lead to, you know, and what they're trying to show is, mostly we have the, we, we develop these dispositions to respond in certain ways, some, you know, culturally influenced too, but, um, and then we think, and we spend a lot of time just spinning the wheels trying to make good, and when you actually look at their experiments they do, people make up a lot of wacky things that, you know, don't fit with what the, the way the scenario was put out. Okay, so, so in, in the particular instance, in the story you just told, the intuitive um, mm -hmm. rejection mm -hmm. of the brother and sister having sex, well, you could describe it in terms of a taboo. Yes. Which is, which, which yeah. you know, I don't know if it's, if it's intuitive. I mean, I think it well, partially is intuitive and, and it's partially not. I think it's a more complicated thing than that, than, than, than just... I think it's a very complicated thing that partakes of both intuition, but also a very strong cultural element that's historically, uh, that, that goes back in time kind of forever. I, I, but, yeah, I said the intuitive yes. can have evolutionary, genetic embeddedness. I mean, now it could have developed and it becomes almost a fixity. And yes. the fact that we're going to overcome it, we're not, we, we're not going to overcome that easily, if at all. Mm -hmm. And you see it because even though they don't they have reasons, they'll make them up because to justify the, the well, force I th of Well, I think in this example, there are all sorts of reasons that people might not think about quickly. Such as if a, if a, if a brother and sister have sex together, mm -hmm they might feel that they're really attached in a way that they wouldn't have realized before that, and that might interfere with family life in a yeah. serious well, way. The way the height, sorry to jump in, but the way the height example is written, um, his view is that the, the reasons that people will try to come up with are, are going to be reasons that show some harm in this case. Yeah. And that's a kind of classic example. Um, of, right. of such a reason. So, so he's written the example very carefully to say afterwards they go their separate ways and you know, there's not going to be any awkwardness at future kind of family occasions. But people are, are desperate, I mean at least this is Haidt's view, people are desperate to use reason uh, to show that there's some kind of harm and that this harm justifies the, the feeling of yuck that, that they have. And so it's the, this kind of separation of reason from intuition that okay that at least in the case of these moral intuitionists, these social intuitionists, show that reason is definitely a kind of after the fact add-on and very late um, entrant into the party. In fact, there's a, a wonderful quote um, that I just tracked down from, I think his name is uh, D.W. Lewis of, uh, no, D.K. Lewis of Possible, he's a philosopher who wrote about possible worlds, and he, he says that, um, the rat in the prisoner's dilemma uh, thought experiment was short for rational. This is his um, this is his view that if you really want to kind of try to rat out of something, <laughs> you use your reason to figure out ways to to get out of um, of of you, know, you use reason basically to 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 get yourself off the hook to get yourself off the moral hook. So would that be the same thing as the reflective consciousness? which imaginatively goes back. No, he's, no. he's making a separate I'm saying that, that height doesn't go far enough. There right. is a place for reflective consciousness and valuation. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm challenging the height. So, that, so that's your, your add-on. But, add but on. That, re, that reflective process is fundamentally imaginative, so we mm -hmm. need a theory of imagination. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, highly, it's highly affective, mm -hmm. you know? And yet, and, 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 and so I want to say, and, it, and the answer is not given in advance. It's, a, it's, it's an actual activity of creative problem solving. That that's what mor moral deliberation is about. And would it be part of, uh, is it somehow exempt from what you were talking about earlier, where we tend to parse out you know, our aesthetic capability, conscience, our political views, our religious views? Does that faculty of imaginative, um, you know, imaginative, uh, reflective consciousness. Is that somehow not part of that? Of okay, so let, let's take what David was talking about earlier. I mean, you know, the rational actor theory. Mm -hmm. Well, you could say if you, if you have, if you let your, if your imagination of the possibilities is constrained by classic rational uh, actor, 
economic man or whatever assumptions, mm -hmm. hey, you've shut off a lot of possibilities for, I mean, so you can't, I mean, it depends on who you are. You know, some people have, you know, have a, a tolerance for ambiguity, which is what, what we need, I think, in these situations. They recognize the richest, it's not just means ends calculation, it's not just cost benefit analysis, it's a lot more, con if it were cost benefits analysis, then you, you, know, you start quantifying and all of that. So what the process of imaginative deliberation involves is it will depend on the individual. And that's why Martha Nussbaum thinks that you know, engagement with literature can sh sharpen moral perceptiveness mm -hmm. because you learn to dwell in the complexities of, of the human situation and see how they play out. Okay, and, and can I just ask if, if your triangulation of conscience, consciousness, and conscientiousness uh, jives with this account? Yeah, I, you know, I, um, so there, there is this, uh, let me invoke uh, Edward Said's between system and culture, right? And, and so I think that <clears throat> much of what we uh, conceive of as um, moral decisions, <clears throat> intuitive or not, are actually so heavily influenced by, by system and culture, we could probably track almost everything. And, and, and if you go back to Vico, then you can go back to, and this whole idea of the human ages, you can also track them back to, uh, or sort of the biblical myths, you know, the, the, the burial of uh, uh, Cable and, I mean, uh, Cain and Abel, and uh, um, uh, the, the leaf, the fig leaf, Adam and Eve, and all these things that are so embedded in us, you don't even know where to start. Um, and, and also this little narrative I, I like to share, which is uh, when, when my son was born, um, uh, you know, it's, he crowned. He was just right there. Uh, couldn't come out for the longest time. We didn't know why. And when he came out, he came out uh, after tearing uh, his mother uh, uh, with his uh, fist like this asleep. That's why. That's exactly how his mother sleeps. Not to make that uh, public knowledge, but. Um, <laughs> and, and since then, it hadn't really left me to, to uh, you know, this notion of how in God's name did he learn that? You know, and I don't think we know that. We don't know enough about sleep. Some of the conversation here is the same thing about what we don't know about dreams, right? And, and the function of dreams, uh, you know, whether dreams are spandrels or whether they serve any function at all, uh, and what we make of them. I think it's a fascinating concept into, into this concept of, of consciousness and, and conscience as well. Um, I'm a believer that dreams mean nothing. Um, you know, they, they nothing more than what your lived life means. Um, I think they're pretty cool sometimes, but that's a different story. Uh, the aesthetic aspect, you know, they, they, it offers something to the imagination, and I don't want to dispel that. But I'm trying to say that there is so much we don't know about sleep, dreams, consciousness, memory, uh, uh, genetics, um, that, uh, it, you know, uh, sort of similar to what he said to me, I agree with his premise, but I also give this cautionary thing of, of saying that, wow, that you can go to the other extreme if you're not careful, and not you, but in, you know, where actually you lend a hand to almost fascist ideology, right? Because the moral fundamentalism that you, you, you want to be careful against, you, you're sort of suggesting to those who may mishear you that you can actually go and do whatever because there is no, you know, so, so I think, and, it's, and obviously you're aware of this because obviously it's that psychosis that, uh, if I can call it that, that Kant had or, or, you know, others, and it still failed. You know, we still had the Holocaust yeah. and we still had all that stuff and, you know, and, and so, so I, 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 you know, period. Lucy, you've been patient. Um, thank you. Um, should I speak into the mic or is this okay? Um, so, this was just a fascinating panel as a as a whole, but I just had a couple of of, of questions, and forgive me if these are uh, what they are, which is rooted in, in ignorance. But I wanted to just ask for a couple of clarifications. One was um, for your distinction between conscience and conscientiousness. Um, that really. Um, that got to sort of the, a, a question that's been on my mind for the last two, you know, today and yesterday, which was, where do we situate judgment um, along this continuum? Because it seems to me that, uh, you know, per perceptually or phenomenologically, or you know, in terms of experience, uh, what we are the part of that process that we're aware of, 
the initial intuitive response, the gut reaction, um, feels profoundly different from a conscious process of moral deliberation. And, and when we talk about moral deliberation, that's a process that I think we all are aware of and we, we, where we can talk about this, this process of, uh, for which I think that this dramatic imaginative rehearsal is an incredibly good way to think about that. Um, I wanted to ask if the initial sort of uh, adrenaline-ridden um, feeling of repulsion or uh, rejection yes. is the same. Is it a shortened and 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 more rapid version of the same thing that happens under the surface, or is it? There's right? a pro approach avoidance behavior. There's just we we talked about disgust reactions. Right. You know, I mean, this the human Startle response mind. Yeah. Is, is embodied, and, and we recruit, I mean, these disgust reactions emerge, they're very hard to get over, and there's a lot of work, Paul Rosen's work, on the importance of disgust as a basis for moral revulsion. And I mean, he's made a career out of that, and has students working on that sort of stuff now, so exactly. Okay. And, and, and I wanted, yeah, and I just, I wanted to go back to something Fadi said, I mean, I, I was thinking about this idea of this, you know, there was a time when conscience meant consciousness and conscience, and, and, and I, then I started thinking, so what does consciousness require? Well, I'm following Damasio here, but it requires a capacity to feel changes in your body state, he'll say. And notice what that is. Instead of it just running its course, you actually, there's a step back mechanism that lets us, it, he would say, make maps of our maps but where we can feel how our bodies are changing. And that step back is also what you need for conscience and conscientiousness. And so I wanted to say that conscientiousness is, an, is, a, is a virtue of moral inquiry, whereas <laughs> conscience was too much tied historically to, you know, a, a, connected to, a connection to a fixed set of, you know, defining principles, whereas conscientiousness says what we need to be is open to the plurality of issues we need this kind of exploration. So I would call it more a, 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 a supreme moral virtue okay. than a faculty. Okay. And, for, and for, for, for both of you, actually, there was a, you know, there was a recognition of, of um, the variety of reasons for doing things, the, the variety of sources of this, of, of response some of which are computed and some of which are uncomputed, right? Some of which we're aware of and, and can process and, and, and some of which we, we can't actually even talk about or think because we don't have access to that portion of our thought. Um, is there a difference between those, those processes? Is that, is that difference between the portion of, the, of, the, of this thinking that we're talking about, the portion of that that we are aware of and can discuss and make sense of and make meaning with, and the portion that is in some way, um, yeah. we can glimpse at it through through scans and through fMRIs, but we can't actually. See, I think that's a great. Percept, um, I mean, it. what what it suggests is that. Um, so, is there something that cognitive neuro, neuroscience can give you that you can't get through phenomenology or through uh, critical literary theory or critical legal theory? Yes, I mean, because since ninety some percent of our thinking, I believe, um, and our processing of meaning goes on beneath the level of consciousness, we, we, we have only very limited, now the fact that it runs unconsciously, not non-consciously, non doesn't mean that we can't in, in some occasions bring aspects of that to consciousness, but some of them we never can. And so that's where you need other methodologies to help you see what's activated. And, and so this is where mirror neurons come in. You know, when, when I see you grasp um, that cup, parts of my motor cortex and premotor cortex that would be involved if I grasp the cup are activated. And people are saying, and, and so this is what's called the simulation theory of meaning. And it's that to understand this uh, is to simulate a process with all its affect and with its sensory motor dimensions. And I think that's at the heart of morality. Now, a lot of this goes on beneath the level of our conscious awareness. We're not aware that our m motor neurons are firing off for grasping when we see grasp, but they are. 
And the premotor cortex is even firing because that has to sequence the motor synergies of your fingers into a smooth grip. And so you just can't access that consciously. And, you know, but, but, and, and so people are saying that could be the basis for empathy, you know, being, being able to be, and be with the other. Now just think of how much uh, a child learns actually, picks up from, and it's, it's, it's shocking sometimes. And it's probably most of it has to do with the simulation <clears throat> stuff. Their brain is firing, they're learning as they're observing or listening or being. On the, on the mirror neurons, I know that's been used by Jacoboni and others, you know, to be a specifically moral trait, but as you say, if it's spread through, if, if the brain and the body is basically one big process of mirroring, you know, would you, I mean, is yeah. the human being basically a moral organ, or is it just that we're so, we are so built to, to reflect and process others? Yeah, see, I, I think moral is, we're, we're, problem-solving creatures. We have to, to survive and to flourish. You know, we, we need, and so we've developed these processes for homeostasis and allostasis to continue going forward. And I think morality is about a form of going forward. And we can, we can say there's moral experience because we tend to think, well, moral means having to do with well-being. And then the question is, who's well-being? And under what conditions? So, I, yeah, we're moral beings. I think, in, you know, um, we, to be human is to be a moral being. I just don't want to say there are uniquely moral experiences because I think virtually, if I paint my house day glow orange, is that an aesthetic issue or a moral issue? My neighbors aren't going to think it's just aesthetic. So I just think these are things we sort of impose because we have interests. Like we want to talk about well-being, we'll call that moral, I'm fine with that. You know, I want to sort of run a parallel to the Deleuze comment, uh, you know, this, this uh, so, so at least as I understand it, about the mirroring, you know, and, and because for me as a poet, the, the notion of mirroring means that I'm constantly stuck in representation, and there is something problematic, you know, in poetry, I think there is, for me at least, and for, for many other poets, there's a way where you always want to struggle with, with, with being stuck in the representative only. You want to go beyond that. And so, interestingly, Deleuze goes about this uh, schizophrenic, right, uh, you know, in, in uh, Anti-Oedipus, you know, schizophrenia in the capitalist mind. And, and, and I guess a, a brief way to say it is that he considers, uh, to sort of use Marx's words, um, uh, homeostasis to be the psychoanalytic theory, you know, or this, this idea towards the normative you know, or to use Jacqueline Rose, you know, the woman as symptom, you know, uh, uh, sort of thing. And he says, well, maybe what you need is a transformative or becoming process, not a representative process, not purely mirroring. And that goes to allostasis, I think, where, where actually, and, and sort of this is, again, this is a very theoretical way of answering the questions that, well, what do you, what do you propose for breaking out of this dilemma with, with, you know, with medicine and ethics of triage and so forth, which is to say basically try to break away from the sense of always turning everything back to a normative notion that was already imposed on us and we don't question it anymore just because it's 400 years old or whatever. Did, did you, by the way, have prepared comments, Mike? Uh, I, well, I, did, I, um, I had a sort of a question, which was about, uh, no, I, I, I called on you, so All right. can't, you can't call on me well, back with, with your it, mirror I'll, neurons. I, I, just, I will try I to make got, it really. Got, I just got almost got duped by right, your then mirror I, then neurons. I will end my questions with a question to you, but um, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, Mark and and everybody's discussion. It strikes me. I'm thinking back to my 18th century moralists. I talk about mm -hmm. yesterday who would say that's fine. Everything you said is fine. There's nothing you said that would contradict Hutchinson's sense of the moral sense or Jonathan Edwards's sense, what we are just saying is that God works through all these processes. Socialization, uh, peculiar uh, uh, localized experiences, socially reformed things, teaching. Um, so they would say, Mark, yeah, certainly. But what we had gain, <laughs> what we gain by saying this is God implanted or get God organized is a certain kind of communal authority. What we lose is the danger of authoritarianism or 
but what we gain from that, of course, is a, a bulwark against mere individualism, subjectivism, collapsing into the Hannah Arendt uh, dilemma that we had yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the comment. My question is, Blakely, what did you have to say? <laughs> Actually, my, my, okay, so I, um, I'm maybe in the, uh, in the sort of minority view in this room that I, I didn't think that Professor Johnson went far enough in trying to dispense with uh, moral rationality. I think that moral rationality is a, um, is a very sort of uh, devilish feature of our uh, cognitive armature, um, and my my sort of example for, for showing that that's the case is the example that he began with, namely the woman who hit his car. Uh, suppose, just for the sake of argument, that um, we could do a little experiment where we had 100 people hit your car and see how many of them left notes. I would predict it would be maybe 20. Um, uh, does that mean that those 80 other people don't have a conscience? No. All it means uh, is that they um, didn't their sort of valuation process led them to conclude that, 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 that they would be chumps um, to leave themselves open to some sort of future encounter with you and your, your insurance company. Um, so, uh, um, so I guess, uh, so I guess my, my question for you is how do you explain, I mean, I'm not asking you to, to give an account of her personally, but how do you explain this uh, outlier woman and her, her actions? Given, given your theory. Um. Well, I, th that seems actually pretty easy. Um, be, you know, we grow up, we have experiences, <coughs> and there's a process of our moral development. And some people develop certain dimensions of character. They develop some virtues and not others. Things happen to them. I mean, I, it seems to me um, that we, we have, we have a, a number of different stories from different perspectives to tell about how she comes to that. And we go do that, that's interesting. We wanna look into that. How can we cultivate certain virtues we want? You know, I mean, that, there's nothing new in this about that. Right. But yeah. Can I say that uh, if I were in the study, proposed study, uh, that I, I could be two people because I've done in my history, yeah. right, uh, where I did not contact yeah. and then later on I contacted sure. the person in a different in this, accident. In the same, no, yes. different different occasion. Right, but, yeah. but I'm, I'm two different people sure. in this, so we go into yeah. this allostatic uh, uh, notion. No. And then there's also, um, uh, again, and I think everybody is, is talking to the same thing, there's also the, 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 the distinction between the, um, the, the act of common decency, simple act, and our, our uh, impulse towards the heroic. So, you know, they're, they're, we want, you know, when she said what she said, if, if I may sort of uh, uh, impose too much, is there is an impulse in all of us to sound too damn good, yep. you know, because it means something for us. But in the end, it's just a simple act and, and a simple decision, as you say, she arrived at in, in her processes of life. And um, Blakey, I want to say um, the view of rationality I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that more morality isn't about rules. Yes. It's not about bringing cases under principles, however broadly you describe them, because that misunderstands, people may think that's what it is, the commandments and all, but, it, but that is, if you look at the way human concepts are structured, they don't work that way. Um, and, we, and that's where cognitive science can tell us something. They don't have necessary and sufficient conditions for applications. Life is messy. We learn prototypes and we learn principles for extending from prototypical cases of justice, fairness, you know, care, empathy. And, but, but it's not, we've got concepts that map onto situations in the world and they can be brought under principles which are completely literal because most of our concepts are metaphoric and multivalent. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Nancy. This is, this is, I know we've got a break for lunch, and so it's just an anecdote um, to match the, the car anecdote. But, but both of you have been insisted, not insisted, but you've mentioned cases in which adults do things. And I understand um, how that could kind of accumulate in a mind. You know, you go through certain experiences, your, your culture uh, kind of, you know, you're inculcated with certain values. But does this work with children? I mean, and, and the, the anecdote would be that, um, forgive the, the uh, 
self-reference, but when I was about seven, my mother drove me to the movies and told me to call her on the payphone, which they had back then, when I needed to be picked up. And I called her, and I could hear that the dime didn't go where it was supposed to. It went back where I could pick up the dime. I had my dime back. And I opened that little flap thing, and there were four dimes in there. And my immediate thought, before the, before the thought that, you know how many candy bars you could buy with four dimes? No, I thought, this, this doesn't belong to me. This belongs to some, some authority figure. And so who is my authority figure? The 15-year-old who sold popcorn. And I went to him and said, this came out of the payphone. And he said, well, it's not mine. And I said, well, it's not mine, so here. Now, the only, <laughs> the only, the only, I mean, my family was not a family that, you know, there were too many kids, and so no one sat us down and said, look, if you ever find four dimes in a payphone, here's the right thing to do. And in fact, I think the only moral or conscientious authority I might have had would have been Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> so, so how do you deal with the, the with children? And, and maybe, well, maybe there's a, a couple it, it, minutes too. Just in one sentence, I'll just say, this is what Paul Churchland argues about this, you know, that uh, he's giving connectionist models of moral learning, but he says, you learn, you were inculcated in terms of prototypical activities. How did you learn justice? Well, you gave her two cookies, and you only gave me one, okay? Or she got to ride on the bike for twice as long as I did. I mean, how do we learn justice? That's how we learn justice. I mean, and you, you learned about mine and thine, and what you, or what, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we, 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 the claim is that moral development is a kind of working up in the cognitive emotional system of prototypes that get activated in situations. And then the question is, how well does this situation fit, and how does all that work? But so it's a very again, I, it's complicated, but I think at one level it's what Fadi was saying. Well, you know, it's not surprising. I mean, obviously there were some influences there that formed up a certain disposition toward what was mine. I, is this, I, I don't know whether we have time for one more comment. But I, I, I find what you're saying um, extremely plausible and attractive up until a point a few minutes ago where you talked about morality is not a matter of rules. Mm -hmm. We have different moral systems, different normative systems. Think about political morality. Think in particular <coughs> about the morality of human rights, the Universal Declaration. Full of rules, what are human rights? There's rule, basically rules of conduct for government. <coughs> things government should not do, things it should do. And questions arise as to whether something government is doing violates this rule or doesn't violate this rule. So I, I, I think you need to be cautious and be more specific when you say morality is not a matter of rules. Sometimes it is a matter of deciding whether this behavior is consistent or inconsistent with this rule of conduct. Okay, two, two quick things. Like I want to say first, um, there's a notion of principles in Dewey. He says moral principles, we have moral principles, we can articulate them. They are summaries of modes of interaction and response that a, a people has found important given the history of the kinds of situations they've encountered. And you would be a fool, not, they have deep moral entrenchment for us. Okay, so I wanna say there's a place for principles, but then principles aren't rules in the technical sense. I wanna say rules aren't rules. That is, if you really understand how, how rule application works, like say in the law, it's, it, it's not in terms of classical category structure with necessary and sufficient conditions and just, you know, the whole notion of the intent and all is, is, a, is a, you know, like, well, um, our moral reflection ought to just capture the original intent. I just think that it's not a useful way to think of what we're doing as bringing cases under laws, but it is useful to say we have principles, we but principles are not, Rules, they're just summaries of wisdom. When the principles wisdom. are sufficiently determinate, yeah. we cross over from being principles into rules. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. That's right. So, shall we okay. wrap it up? Thank yeah. you very much.